and I'm going to slightly misquote you, but to make a larger point, you're asking uh, because aggressive sales doesn't work anymore, does that mean nothing works and we just have to be good to each other and hope for the best? No, total bullshit. That's not true. Hello, Sales Nation. I am Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. If you need a boost in confidence, both in and out of business, you should check out yesterday's show with Jim Wolf. But on today's show, we have Tucker Max, and we're talking about the stereotype of the salesperson, how it's changed, how it's changing, and we come on to why Tucker, CEO of BookInABox.com and best-selling author, why he doesn't hire quote-unquote salespeople. So, with all that said. Without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Tucker, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome. I'm a big fan of yours, your work, and I think we're going to have a really interesting... Well, I know we are from your background and other shows I've listened to where you've been on as a guest. We're going to get some intriguing insights to some of the questions I've got to throw at you today. And where I want to start, and clearly a massively leading question here, Tucker, I, and I want, to, I want to get your thoughts on this. Is the stereotype of the the salesperson this loud, overly talkative, you know, chest pumped out alpha, or you know, perhaps inauthentic alpha male, and they're putting on this kind of show and the charade? Is that the personality that, from your experience, uh, both in your business that you do now, which we'll come on to, uh, and everything else that you've been through in the books you've written and, and all that, is that the personality type that? does the best at building rapport and building relationships with people no not at all no <laughs> right I, mean, okay. I, mean, I can explain a lot but the answer is fine i know no. uh, clear, clear you're going to say that but what i want to get into before we get into why and what the best personality for all this is and what traits perhaps we can accentuate and and what traits we can put back on the back burner to to improve ourselves as men from this perspective why do so many people put on this salesperson stereotype why is it so prominent in in the world of sales so i think there's two reasons one is that for a long time in a lot of industries it, it did work uh, uh and then the second reason is i think most people don't think for themselves about how to act or how to be in any situation and i think at least in america i know the cultural narrative around sales and the media around sales. I don't mean like necessarily news media, but the movies, the TV shows, uh, the plays, all those things portrayed sales that way. So it's sort of like um, once you portray a type of person a certain way, a lot of time, even if that's not real, the real versions of that will become that. I'll, I'll give you gr two great examples. The first one is The Godfather. You know the movie The Godfather, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, uh, Mario Puzo wrote that book and true fucking story Mario Puzo did not know any gangsters did not know any mafioso uh, he essentially read stuff about them and then created this elaborate world like kissing the ring and all these things are totally made up well what happened is all the mafia watched that show uh, watched that movie sorry and then uh, uh, half the things that were in that movie became ingrained in mafia culture like, it was nuts, right? So a guy who didn't know anything about the mafia ended up setting a lot of uh, the sort of, um, a lot of the narrative and the culture that the real mafia adopted. Another great example, uh, this is maybe less of your audience will know. That, actually, here's a, here's a great example that has to do with sales. So we, one of the iconic sort of salesman uh, movies is Glenn Gary, Glenn mm -hmm. Ross, right? Coffee is for closers. You know, first place gets a steak knife, second place gets fired, whatever. Um, that movie, uh, uh, you asked David Mamet, or sorry, it started as a play and then became a movie. David Mamet said he was not just satirizing, but also deeply critiquing the sales culture, right? But it, what inevitably happens with parody and satire is that the people who don't get the joke become the joke. And so... Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and uh, Coffee is for Closers started as a way of putting down salespeople. And now salespeople <laughs> say it as a way to like uh, uh, embody and exemplify their culture, right? So the movie that was supposed to critique a lifestyle and an attitude actually ended up becoming the model for the attitude. 
Uh, that's the way I think that's worked. And so getting perhaps bigger picture here pretty quickly, if it's worked in the past, what has shifted that this doesn't work anymore? You know, presumably we're going to dive into the internet culture and, and things of that nature, but what's changed? Well, uh, I think a couple things have changed. Uh, so long term, I think American, the American public has just become, I don't know if intelligence is the right word, more culturally sophisticated. And so uh, when you went from an agrarian culture of low, I mean, I'm talking about hundreds of years, you know, generations, agrarian culture, uh, low education, low sophistication, then a lot of what amount to scammy sales techniques can work. Uh, but then as people become more sophisticated and more culturally aware, those techniques don't work anymore. Um, the other issue, that, and this is a longer-term trend, but it is shorter on the long-term trends, is digital media, the internet. Uh, what that's uh, created is essentially the, because it's so cheap, there's essentially a zero transaction cost to information with this thing or the computer we're on. I can find out anything about anyone. And so now, instead of using someone's attitude and personality as an indicator of their trust. I can actually go look at people who have dealt with them. I can find that information cheaply and easily. So now, uh, uh, scamming, pe uh, conning people doesn't work anymore in the long term, and definitely not at scale. And so, um, it, it, short term, it can always there's always ways to scam people. Long term, it's a bad business model. And so that's why I think um, people have started to really shift. I mean, I can t talk about our sales process deeply. We don't even call it sales because we don't even want it associated with the word sales. Uh, but uh, that's why I think so many people, so many of the old upfront scamming mm -hmm. techniques, it just slowly, they're just working less and less and less and less and less people. And they, they only work really on dumb people now. It is a great example. No, I'll tell you. Do you know why... Um, uh, Spammers, like literal spammers, like the Kenyan Prince uh, Akam mm. Dande, like uh, schemes. Do you know why they write those emails that are so like the language is all messed up and everything's misspelled? Do you know why they do that? Because they work. Yeah. No. Yes, but the reason they work is because it automatically excludes intelligent people. As soon as you read an email that's got a bunch of misspellings from a prince, a prince, right? You're like, get this out of here. But the dumb people. Like they don't see those things and so they're actually – it's a cheap, easy way to select for people who will fall for their scams, right? Uh, and so that's actually why they do that. Well, let's put this uh, into context and project this forward slightly then, Tucker, to redefine – because a lot of what you're saying uh, – to just t take a step back there. A lot of what you're saying makes total sense. There's a lot of sales gurus. There's a couple of people that have been on the show, but I've avoided most of them that are still pushing this pushy sales uh, and uh, and it's just a horrible, icky way of doing it. And I'm a millennial, most of the audience are millennials and everyone is pushing back against it. There's a weird shift happening where social selling is this big buzzword and that's bullshit as well. Um, but what I want to get from you and get your insights on it is, are we moving away in sales, marketing, business in general from, you use the word techniques to sell and close deals? And are we moving into 100% into the realm of it's so, your personal branding is so exposed out there that you don't need to use techniques anymore. You just need to no. be good. No, that's not valuable. true at all. That's, that's nonsense as well. That's total nonsense. It, it's just that the techniques are changed. There will always be ways to do things better than other ways. Um, what you're asking is uh, essentially boils down to, and I'm going to slightly misquote you, but to make a larger point. You're asking, uh, because aggressive sales doesn't work anymore, does that mean nothing works and we just have to be good to each other and hope for the best? No. Total bullshit. That's not true. Um, Let me come back at you then, because that's not quite what I was saying, and I obviously didn't put my point across clearly enough. What I'm saying is there's there's closing techniques, there's you know, sentences that you say and using NLP and, and all these things that you know very easily cross over from influence to manipulation. Clearly, a lot of that is nonsense. It doesn't work. A lot of people know what it is. So if someone is using any of these techniques on you and you realize it instantly, rapport's gone, trust is gone. Yeah. What yeah. I'm saying is, is the technique now 
just to add value and be an industry expert is that the technique or no no if you just do that and nothing else you're gonna fall behind the people who are doing the smarter things no and put it into context what would be a smarter thing okay um uh, let me talk about in context of my company how sure. we do it because I think I'm not going to say we're cutting edge but I think that we do it smarter than most people I've seen <laughs> uh, and it took us a, quite, a, quite a while to get <laughs> here um, so uh, like I don't want to like uh, like uh, we made a lot of mistakes on the way but so the way we look at sales is we don't uh, sales will always be sales you're always going to have to have someone uh, people who are interested in what you have there's always going to need to be a bridge between interest and actual use and payment, right? Always. Uh, the only people who I, I was about to say the only people who don't need sales are drug dealers. That's not even true anymore. Now that pot's illegal, the marijuana <laughs> marketing business is huge, right? Um, so, uh, and then by the way, how do you get people hooked on drugs? You let them try it first, right? That's marketing. That's sales. That's a, a, a form of sales. So. There's always techniques. The question is, which ones should you use and which ones work? It used to be the ones that work were scammy. I don't think the ones that work, uh, the scammy ones work anymore. So what, what, what do you do now? Here's what we do. We approach, we're selling something that everybody wants. So my company is called Book in a Box. And what we do, we've created a new way to go from idea to book. So if you're a CEO or an entrepreneur or a professional, you've got a great idea for a book and you don't have the time to sit down and spend a year or two writing it and getting it published yourself, all you have to do is get on the phone with us and we ask you questions. We get everything out of your head. We structure it into a book. We do, uh, you know, uh, we turn your interviews into, into book prose. We do all the work on the back end. But your words, your ideas, everything. And um, uh, it, 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 there's a huge amount of uh, audience for this, huge uh, client base because tons of people want books. Tons of people can use books mm -hmm. and we are solving the problem in a really, uh, a really innovative new way. So for us... We, say, we look at sales as uh, qualification. Education, qualification. So our calls are structured like this. So someone sees or hears about us, like because of this podcast, for example, uh, or um, uh, because of uh, uh, word of mouth. Uh, that, by the way, one of the reasons we uh, – the best sales you can do, obviously, is doing a great job – having a great product and, 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 and servicing it well because it creates word of mouth – which is, uh, of course, like the, the best sales you can have is someone coming in who, who's heard good things about you. There's no, no better way to, to market and sell. So someone comes in, they have already heard about us, they know they want to do a book. So now the question is, do they want to work with us? So we don't start pitching them, telling, talking about us. The first thing we do is we say, tell us about your book idea. We listen, right? So we want to understand who this person is why they're writing a book, and what they really want from that book, right? Because some people shouldn't be working with us. Like they have it, it, interests or the reasons they're writing a book. It's not that they're invalid. They just don't fit with our process well. So we actually want to identify and discover the people who should not be working with us. And we want to tell them they shouldn't be working with us because it saves both of us, right? It saves us the aggravation of working with someone who's a bad fit because they're going to be – we don't want to work with people who are bad fits – and they're going to be unhappy and they're going to say bad things about us. So we don't want to be in that business because it creates negative word of mouth, right? So uh, we, we absolutely tell people, we listen, tell people who aren't good for us. And then the ones who are, we think are good matches, uh, we then go the next step and ask them, uh, step two is, what's the ROI for them, right? So how are you going to use this book? Uh, how, how's it going to make you money or, or get you status or get you something you value? And how much is that value, Right? And so, for example, if you want to write a book to become a speaker, right, you want to keynote tech conferences, let's say, or, or in your example, you want to drive, uh, you want to uh, create an audience for a, a salesman teaching or something, right? Uh, they're different, but totally valid. So the ROI for keynoting tech conferences can be really huge. The ROI for, you know, your salesman training can be really huge for you. And so we try to identify what you're going to use for the ROI and then about how much you think you can make. Um, or about how valuable it is. Because it's not just about money. For some people, it's about a, a building authority and credibility, which will get them other things that they want. There's, it's not just a dollar and cents thing. So we help them get very clear what, why they're writing the book, what result they want to get, and what that result is worth to them. Then we say, okay, uh, 
I don't know how much you know about our process. Could we explain it in depth, but not everyone reads, right? So we say, um, we think you're a great fit because of these reasons, right? We need people who have X, Y, Z. You have X, Y, Z and more. We think you're a great fit for our process. We'd love to work with you. Now, why don't you ask me uh, uh, questions? Like, what are your questions? Do you understand the process? If not, I can explain everything. Do you understand the process, but you just have a specific questions? Let's address those and answer those. So we open the floor to them because everyone has different concerns and different issues, right? And we can sit here and fuck blah, 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 blah for 30 minutes and get them hyped up. And, but if we don't answer their question, it was a total waste of everyone's time. So we get them to talk, start talking, uh, answer the, we answer all their questions, right? And if you notice right now- How much, let me just jump in here for a second. How much of your sales process and your success from it, and this will lead to a couple more questions in a second, comes from you narrowing down this step-by-step -step, and if you're data-driven, you know your conversion rates for each point of the conversation and perhaps there's a basic script and there's a formula that we're all working from. How much of your sales team success comes from that? versus the individual salesperson, their personality, and their, it's not their about ability to sell. It, it, we, uh, so we but actually this, don't- This is what I'm intrigued as to- Yeah, so we don't hire salespeople. Yeah. Like, because the person that, that, this is a qualification process, because the person you're talking to, if you're an author and you're talking to me, I'm the one who's actually gonna be your project manager and take you through the whole process. So we actually look at our sales process as a relationship building process. So we, we, we have not, not really a deep script, it's a basic script. So there's three parts of the conversation and you know the, the things you need to learn from the person. But it's your job to, within the context of the conversation, find a way there, and because and, it's gonna be different for everybody, right? Um, so once we've answered their questions, then, uh, and usually by then, if they're not a fit, they know and we tell them. We tell them exactly why they're not a fit, right? Then if, if, if they're a great fit, they have, all the, they have a great ROI, they have a great book idea, we, we think we can work with them. We say, all right, so like we'd love to work with you. you, you know, uh, we've answered all your questions. Is there anything else you need to know? What, uh, you know like, uh, uh, what other information do you need to make a decision about this? And then most of the time, they'll be like, nothing. I think this is great. Send me a contract. Let's go. And then, uh, then a lot of times, though, that question will raise the last objection. Or, well, i got to talk to my wife. Or, well, this. Or, well, that. Okay, no problem. Um, do you need anything from me? Yes, no. If yes, we figure it out. If no, whatever. Then we set another time to talk and, uh, and, and, and close the loop. Either they're going to be a client or they aren't. If they're not, it's no problem. And what we do is people who aren't a good fit we tell them uh, not only why they're not a good fit, but what else they could do instead, right? So like someone who wants to write a novel, we don't do novels. So we say, right, we have, but we have a list of resources for, that we recommend for novelists to make it easier for them, and we send that to them. So our, our people are looking to create a win off of the call. They want to build a relationship and create a win. And uh, working with us is not the only win. Do you see a shift here? Because all this is based on your inbound marketing. So you've got in, an inside inbound uh, sales team following up on the leads that are coming in from the, um, and it, there's of course different ways to dress it up and different words to describe it. But that, that's how I see the system. Do you think that that is a shift that's gonna be, and it's clearly industry specific, but do you see that that's a shift that's gonna go yes. across most industries and you're gonna have less of, again, this horrible stereotype of the guy on the phone making 500 calls a day uh, yes. and cold calling. So, and I agree with you. Why do you think that that is happening? Is this purely on the back of, it's very difficult for an individual salesperson to break through the noise that's out there in the media and social and everywhere else. Whereas a company and a figurehead such as you at the top of the company can perhaps do that better. Is that is that why? I, I, yes, but I think there's a larger shift going on. I think it's that for the most part, as a culture and as a people, um, we are shifting away from consumerism and towards meaning. And uh, no one cold, cold calls for meaning. You know, I, I, that's not quite true, but for the most part. And, and, and so I think what companies, look, look the whole reason uh, a market exists is to allocate resources, right, to, to their highest valued use. So if you have 20 grand, which is what we charge, uh, if a book of your ideas is worth way more than 20 grand, if your time's very valuable and a book's worth more than 20 grand, 
you're going to come to us, right? And you're going to give us 20 grand and then we're going to turn your ideas into a book. And you're going to be better off because that book is worth way more than $20,000 to you. We're going to be better off because we have a great system for turning ideas into books and it costs us less than 20 grand to produce. So everyone wins here. We get money uh, for our work. You get a book that helps you in any number of ways, right? So if you have to cold call, it generally means, not always, generally means you have something that other people don't really want that much. Probably, right? Not necessarily. Like if, if you, because you could just be in your situation here, Tucker. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And clearly, what you're doing is working. You're, you're making a huge success out of it, and you're passionate about it. I'm sure. And whether you class this as a cold call or not, if you got on the phone with a CEO, and you know, as um, I'm not sure you tell, but I'm sure you know, CEO or whatever it is within um, the company, that would be essentially a cold call. You would essentially be in be being a salesperson, and I'm only playing devil's advocate here out of interest. But no, you, no, you'd be doing the you're, job you're of missing, the cold calling salesperson. A, there. You're missing a step, dude. We don't. If someone doesn't want to write a book, we don't talk to them. Like, but perhaps they do, don't know they want to write the book until they've had it, the options put in front of them. We don't, we're not in the business of convincing people they should write books. I, I, I'm in the. I, we are in a market where there is a massive unmet demand and we are meeting the demand. So it, it does change the dynamics. Like I'm not going to tell you, B2B software is going to be enterprise sales and cold calling for a long time, right? I get that. That's a different world. And, and, and so that's, but that sales process is, is a whole different thing, right? Um, but for someone, for most things, especially any sort of, not any, most B2C things, people don't need more stuff. They know what they need for the most part, or at least they know what they want, right? Now, there are some things like an iPhone that people didn't even know they wanted until it existed, but then they got really excited about it, whatever, right? I'm not going to say great products need no marketing and sales. That's not true. What I am going to say is that great products, for the most part, market and sell themselves, and that your job in marketing is mostly education, not uh, not pitching, and your job in sales is not persuasion, but listening and education and and um, and uh, uh, qual- qualification. Sure. Well, I think you described it as a project manager or a consultant at the top of the show, and that's how I describe it as well. But I want to come back to what we started the show with because we pivoted here, and it is it's good because I like getting these insights from these different areas of sales rather than just the B two B side of things. But for an individual, a salesperson listening to this. Perhaps they resonated with what we're talking about at the beginning of the show of they are putting on this alpha persona, they are cold calling, down for dollars, all these weird and horrible stereotypes. To use your language, how can an individual like that add more meaning to a conversation and uh, and close more deals that way? Because clearly that's the future of sales. Yeah, so, well, I, I'll tell you, in my experience, man, I have not met a lot of... Um, the most successful salespeople I know, they might have big, bold personalities, but they're not uh, arrogant uh, uh, goofs. You know, they're not assholes. What they do with the big personality is they attract attention to themselves and they build relationships with people. Like our CEO, the guy I just hired to replace me as CEO because I'm not a very good manager, <laughs> and he's he's an amazing CEO. He started in sales. Uh, he started like in banks and all this other stuff. Like. Uh, and the dude, it's not that he, he's very smart, but he's worked in four different industries, totally different, right? Because why? He could sell. But he doesn't sell like actively outgoing, like I'm going to persuade you to buy something you don't want. What he does is he listen, he, he's good at getting people to open up. He's good at listening to people, truly understanding what it is, and then uh, connecting with the people who are right for what he's selling and showing them how what he's selling um, is actually going to get them what they want, right? And he came out like mortgages and uh, uh, like uh, some B2B insurance type things and like stuff where you do have to do outbound cold calling, no doubt, right? And you will for a long time. Um, he came and but he was so successful in those realms because he didn't make the sale the sales about him. He didn't make it about moving his product. He made it about understanding his customer understanding their needs and then meeting their needs. He made it about them. He just did it in a way that was very warm and gregarious and um, outgoing. 
right? So he's someone that I think, his name's JT McCormick, he's someone that like a lot of people might think had the sort of boiler room, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross mentality, except just take the asshole part out, but still be gregarious and outgoing and smart and persuasive. He's a dude you just like, you want to mm-hmm. be around, you know? Which that will always, always, always be part of sales. The stuff that's coming out is the sort of uh, I'm gonna bull, you know, uh, bulldoze you over and make you buy this. That idea. So are these traits of being able to get people to open up, to be able to listen, uh, to be able to connect with people on that deeper level, and especially if we're talking about uh, for B2C as we've just been talking, or the complex B2B sale where you're dealing with the C-suite and you're dealing with people on, over longer terms, you you have to. Because you, you clearly don't buy from anyone that you think is an asshole, to use your language again. It, are those traits that you just have to be born with and you grow up with, and you no. you 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 kind of embrace and learn over time, or are they are they skill sets that we can learn as men and and, and develop? I mean, that's like saying, uh, uh, are you born in shape or are you born fat, and then that's just it. Of course not. Like nonsense. Uh, listen, some people lose weight easier than others. Some people can, uh, are better athletes than others naturally, no doubt. But everyone has a range. Everyone can be in shape. Everyone can be a fat, obese slob. Uh, I think the same is true for this. There are some people who, some people just have that, that, that magic where everyone just likes them, no doubt. And those people just have an easier time of it, no doubt. I'm not going to pretend that that's not true. But I think almost anyone can develop these skills and can good can get good at it. Like some of the best, uh, especially enterprise sales, B two B enterprise sales. Some of the very best people in that realm are introverts, and they're not outgoing and they're not aggressive. But what they are is they're empathetic and they listen and they create actual meaningful interactions with people, and so uh, they they are extremely successful. God, what's his name? Mark. I can't remember his last name. The guy that that was Ben Horowitz's um, uh, uh, head of sales for years at Ops Cloud and, and or Loud Cloud and Opsware, and now um, uh, is at Andreessen Horowitz. He's like this. Like he is like the the most introverted, quiet. I mean, wickedly smart, mm. but like the opposite of the image that you're talking about. And he's a phenomenal B two B sales guy. Now, he, he would never be the guy you want to bring on a podcast like this and kind of be outgoing and fun and, and snap off one-liners, but you put him in a room with people who think rationally and are looking at spreadsheets and want to know numbers, he's going to knock that out of the park, right? And just to get really practical for a second here, Tucker, because we can, we can talk about these in hyperbole all day, are there any, and just to wrap up this part of the show as well, are there any resources? Are there any? Should people be listening to podcasts to learn these skills? Should they be reading books? Should they just be going out and meeting more people? So uh, the the book I would read. There's a lot of books about this. Um, I think most of them are bad. The one <laughs> I'm not the expert on sales books, but the one that I've read that I thought was phenomenal and that my team uh, reads is called Same Side Selling by Ian Altman. And the basic idea is exactly what I explained. And he gives a whole framework for essentially listening, understanding the needs of your potential client, and then seeing if you can meet them and how to do that. And, and it's, it's really good techniques. And it's, it's called same side because the idea is um, you either meet their, you meet their needs and sell to them or you don't meet their needs and you don't sell to them. So it's, it's almost, you could almost think of it like ethical or moral sales as well is another way to frame it. Um, the, the techniques you can absolutely learn from a book and from practice uh, of sales. What you're, I think, talking about is uh, building Rappaport and building um, sort of relationships and understanding people. I think that is not taught very well, and I don't know of a book or anything that does a really good job teaching that, to be honest. I really don't. Nice. We, we, I teach that to my people. JT and I are really good. We teach that to all our people. And it was actually kind of frustrating because we were looking mm. for like what course should we have them take, whatever. We're actually building one internally for our own people because think about what teaches – do you know? Maybe you know. What teaches business people how to have conversations, right? Or, or understand what charisma is and how to develop it within, even within the context of their own personality because introvert charisma is different than extrovert charisma. But they're both, they both work, right? How do you uh, teach how to listen? How do you teach how to uh, understand people? How to how to like because everyone is is you have three things going on with everything: what they're saying, what they aren't saying, and what they can't say. 
right? And you need to understand all three uh, to really understand somebody. Uh, and it's much more important in a, like a romantic relationship than it is a business relationship, but it's still important in a business relationship. I don't, I don't know of the materials that teach that. Do you, dude? Nope. I don't. I think you have got it spot on of the only way I've learned some of these skills um, because I, I don't think I'm terrendously charismatic or anything like that, but I know that I've become more charismatic, easier to talk to, a better conversationalist by just spending more time with people who are good at it. And that's what you, you know, if you're coaching your staff and your team in that method, in, in that way, and just spending time with them, because clearly you're a charismatic guy. Um, that seems to be the only option that I've got to suggest to you uh, from, from that perspective. Yeah, right now, that's it. Uh, <laughs> and it's no, not a I problem. Mean, it's just clearly that's just the best way to, to show it. And it might be that it's down to a lot of it is subconscious. A lot of it is uh, not a technique that you sit and you cross your legs when the prospect cross their legs and you mirror their body language. That's all too false and weird. It, perhaps it is just you spend time with people who uh, have, have grown up with the ability to do this from the parenting, from being self uh, secure and there's probably all kinds of esteem issues that lead into all of this that allow them to be vulnerable and open up and build the rapport and and clearly if it's in your subconscious you can learn that is learnable though man I'll, like, here let me let, i'll give you a quick little mini course on charisma charisma is two things it is warmth and power or a competence uh, in, in english in america Power and competence don't mean the exact same thing, but, but it's kind of a combination is really what charisma is measuring. So it's essentially when you meet someone, you ask yourself two questions. Are they a threat to me, like a physical threat, right? Um, uh, or what do they think about me? Do they like me or, or, or not? Or do they hate me? And can they do their job or can they not do their job? That's actually a really good way to think of it. So um, that's why it's really hard to be charismatic because for most people – uh, competence and power trade off with warmth, right? Like, you know, a lot of people who just exude ability and power, uh, and a lot of people take that power into arrogance. I mean, power is competence. Mm -hmm. Like, I can get a job done, right? Um, but they're, they're not necessarily open and vulnerable and nice because most of the people who are warm and open and vulnerable and nice do that because they're weak or they're not good at their job or they have to be nice because they're low status or whatever, right? It's extremely rare to find someone who can do both. Uh, some great examples. Bill Clinton is the iconic example of charisma because when you're talking to that man, like you're like the whole fucking world is him, is you. Like he focuses on you and he, you feel like you are in his soul, right? Which is that the, he feels vulnerable. That's warmth. And then of course, he, I mean, he's tall. Uh, he exudes competence and power and ability. And that's charisma. Everyone likes people who are powerful and like them. Right, and so that's what charisma is, and teaching, showing how that that dynamic goes. There's ways to do that. The problem is, it's really hard to fake. So you actually mm -hmm. have to learn how to open up in your head to be warm, and how to like so much of power and or competence is uh, physical, right? It's how how do you stand? How do you sit? How do you look at people? How do you hold your hands? These are all, that's unconscious what you're talking about. Those are all deeply unconscious indications of what you think about yourself. Uh, and you reflect them and then people judge those. Nice. And that all ties back into what I was alluding to then of, and I don't know much about this. You may know more about the science of mirror neurons and the, the ability to pick up traits of the people that you're surrounding. But yeah, I guess coaching from what you just said is, is, is probably the best way to teach it, which is why you're having success in that. And Tucker, I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on the show. I know that you're not an out and out B2B salesperson, but you will have insights to these questions, I'm sure. First one, and you might have just mentioned his name, who do you think is the world's greatest salesperson? <sighs> That's a great question. Um, if I think of sales as persuading a group of people to do something, Clinton's pretty good. I might actually say Obama is better. Um, I would actually say Obama and Trump are both better salespeople than Clinton. Clinton's more charismatic. Charisma and sales are not the same thing, sales ability. I look at sales as persuasion, right? Uh, so um, it depends how you define sales. If I'm defining well, it that you're, way. You're defining it. You're, you're answering the yeah. question, how, however you define it. 
the tr- I, I think the, tr- the more traditional definition of sales is the ability to persuade. Uh, and I think two of the best persuaders on earth, uh, at least the ones people know about, are Obama and Trump. And, and they're totally opposite in terms of what they persuade and how they say, say it. I'm just talking about the abilities themselves without taking a stand on, on what they say. Um, those two are masters at their craft. Amazing stuff. And I want you to go deeper with the answer to this question, um, especially having the conversation we just had and knowing a bit about your background. What motivates you to close deals? Um, I believe in what we're doing. The mission, you know? Like, uh, I believe that uh, a lot of people have, I, I not believe, I mean, I know, I see it every day. There's so many smart people out there uh, who have all this wisdom and knowledge in their heads and they don't spread it to a wide group of people, not because they are hoarding it, but because they don't have a means to record it easily and share it easily. And I still think this may change over time. In fact, I'm certain it will. But at least in the next decade or so, a book is still the best way by far to uh, get your knowledge and wisdom out of your head and share it with the world. And um, I think the easier it is for people to turn their ideas and knowledge and wisdom into books, the better the world is. That's how culture and civilization develops and grows, is sharing ideas and mixing ideas and building on the ideas that came before. And um, for it's crazy. We live in this advanced time, and it still takes professionals years to write books how does that make any sense it doesn't make any sense at all we've solved the problem now they can spend 20 hours on phone with us and we get their ideas into a book in their words and their voice and i think we've already seen it we've already done 250 books we've seen an explosion of um not just benefits to the authors but to the readers you know we're connecting people who want things to people who can teach them how to do those things that makes the world a better place. That's why I get excited. I don't get excited about closing deals. I get excited about books being written that help the world. Nice. And final question from me, Tucker. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at sales? Oh, dude. I, you mean after I whipped his ass for being a moron? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, thing, the thing that I really had to understand this is going to sound super counterintuitive, not to you, but to, to probably a lot of your listeners. The thing that I think put me over the top and got really good about persuasion and marketing and sales, because to me those things all kind of blend together, mm-hmm. uh, they're just different forms of selling, um, is that it's not about you. Uh, every time I write something or I say something or I try to sell something and I make it about me, I don't do well. Every time I make it about the other person, I do really well. And that's how our entire sales process uh, starts is – we're there to help the other person solve their problem. And sometimes it means working with us and sometimes it doesn't. But it's, the focus is always on the author and always on their issues and how to solve their problems. And so people love working with us because they feel like we care about them and we're actually on their side, which we are, right? And so, but it took me a long time to realize it's not about me. Amazing stuff. Well, just to wrap up the show, Tucker, tell us a little bit about Book in a Box. We've talked about it. Where, we, where can we find out more about it? Because I know... We, have, we do have CEOs at this and we have solopreneurs and entrepreneurs and clearly a book as a tool. And uh, just to give an example of this, this is what we talked about on the show a bunch of times now, it is the ultimate way to get a referral when you can say, hey, I just, you know, if you enjoyed this, yada, yada, I'll send one to whoever, XYZ, C-Suite member. It's non-intrusive. It's just a super way of getting in the door and physically having your name in front of them constantly on their desk even if they don't read it and they just see the cover. It's this tangible thing. And I think as a, as a referral tool for sales leaders in particular, it's an incredible resource. So tell us more about your business. It, I mean, there's no better all-purpose marketing tool for a professional or CEO or entrepreneur than a book. Yeah. Um, uh, people like to say a book is the new business card. I actually don't agree with that because you can go to Staples and buy business cards, right? <laughs> you can't go to Staples and buy your book. I, I feel like a book is a new college degree. It, it's the new thing where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, college degree used to be a big differentiator, and now everyone has one. So it's like and any moron can go to college, and it's like it's not, a, it's not exclusive anymore. It's hard to do a book, and the thing about a book is that it's risky because now your ideas are recorded in a book so people can ju- read them and judge them. And, but what's good is if your ideas are good, if you have great things to say, people will be lining up to work with you. So, um, and if they're not, maybe you shouldn't be doing that job anyway, right? 
Um, so the, that's what we do, man. It, it, you go to bookinabox.com. It describes the entire process. Uh, it's a, it's, we've solved the, I, I kind of stumbled on this by accident, man. This entrepreneur woman asked me to help her get her ideas in a book without her having to, to type it out for a year. And so we created this process. I didn't think it was going to work and it worked amazing. And now that's about two years ago. And now that we've, you know, we've done about four or five million in two years, uh, 250 books, and we have this incredible process where all you have to do, you have to know what you're talking about because we don't add content. It's not ghostwriting. But we have a structured process to interview you and ask you questions that position your idea, like structure the book, outline the book, and then get everything out of your head and, tur- and, and turn it into book pros. And um, it's really good. It really works. And then, of course, we publish it, professional publishing, great cover, everything. It's, it's the future of publishing. We're just, um, we're, we just started, though, you know? Amazing stuff. I love it. Absolutely love it, Tucker. With that, mate, I want to thank you for your time, your insights, and thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Of course, man. Happy to be here. And there we have it. Thank you, Tucker, for coming on the show. Massively appreciate it, mate. And thank you for pushing back on some of the stereotypes of sales that we all probably fit in line with because it's the the done thing and the to-do thing. And I don't think it's the most effective way to sell. And I think you brought up some great points on the show. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in, as always, I say every episode. But there'd be no show if you weren't giving us your attention. It is a scarce resource. I appreciate that. And with all that said, I'll speak with you again tomorrow.